who wants to talk about a roguelike. I know, I know, you hear about them all the time, you're probably sick of it, but look, I'm not talking about anything new. I'm going all the way back to the year 1990 to talk about Fatal Labyrinth on the Sega Genesis. So yes, obviously as an American, the Sega Genesis version is gonna be the one that I am most familiar with and the one that I've actually played, but the original release came all the way back on November 19th of 1990 in Japan for the Sega Mega Net, AKA the network system. Now I can hear you asking, what in the world is Sega Mega Net? Because I was thinking the same thing when I was reading up on this, but apparently it was an online service for the Mega Drive in Japan that used something called the Mega Modem. Essentially, you would buy a modem that would come with a cartridge that would give you access to an online service that would let you do things like download exclusive games to play, which would include Fatal Labyrinth, but it was known as, well, I'm not going to even attempt the Japanese part, but the subtitle is Labyrinth of Death which honestly is a way cooler name and I kind of wish they kept that here in the US. On top of having to buy the hardware, there was a monthly fee that you had to pay and unfortunately they just couldn't convince enough people to do it because even though you had some games to pick from, there weren't too many and while online multiplayer was an option, there were even less games that supported that. Another way they tried to convince people to use the service was to be able to give you access to other things like being able to do something called Mega Answer that was used for banking purposes. All of this was Sega just trying to compete with Nintendo, which had a similar service set up for their Famicom. While a North American release was announced to be rebranded as the Telegenesis, obviously that never came to be, but it can be seen as a precursor to both the Sega Channel and X-Band. So now without the limitations of trying to make a game small enough to be downloaded over a slow dial-up connection, Sega decided to remake Fatal Labyrinth with some extra artwork to be released on a cartridge. This remake would come out a mere five months later in April of 1991 in North America, and that's pretty impressive when you think about how some games would take literal years to get translated over. Some of this quick turnaround could definitely be attributed to the fact that there is very little in the way of storyline when it comes to Fatal Labyrinth. That story? Dragonia, the Castle of Doom has resurrected. The ghouls from the castle have stolen the Holy Goblet, the Source of Light. Without it, the world will be trapped in darkness forever. If you could actually see what I was reading that came straight from the instruction manual and there are so many commas and exclamation points. I initially was gonna keep reading from the instruction manual because there are even more commas and exclamation points, but basically you get the idea that you become the person who is the volunteer to go and try to retrieve this goblet. If you are so inclined to keep on reading the instruction manual, I do have a link in the description box below, but also a bunch of this is told to you when you go through and talk to the villagers in the initial scene of the game. That scene was actually not in the original Meganet version and was added to the cartridge version, but it can quickly be skipped if you don't care. When you're playing Fatal Labyrinth, you are playing a roguelike in the most strictest sense of the word as the developers were actually fans of the original game Rogue and they wanted to make a game like it. The dungeon that you're going to explore has 30 different floors that need to be completed to finish the game. They are randomly generated as is the placement of all the items and enemies. This game has drawn a lot of comparisons to the Mystery Dungeon series, but it did come out first and it's not exactly the same. You have gameplay that does consist of taking turns on a grid-based system so that every time you take a step, all the enemies will also do one move as well. Pressing the A button will pick up items, but it will also be used to skip a turn. This can be used to be able to get enemies in a more beneficial place for a battle or also to heal up as every few steps that you take will give you some hit points back. Now don't think that this is going to make the game super easy and you can just mash that A button whenever you want to heal up when you're not in battle. If you spend too much time on any particular floor, it'll actually make all the enemies respawn and also at that same time you'll be using up your food that you have. Once your hunger meter goes all the way down, your character will die. The B button is used to cancel anything that you didn't mean to do. And finally, the C button is to pull up your menu and then confirm the options such as managing your inventory or to do certain attacks. I say certain attacks because the majority of the fighting that you're gonna do in the game is actually gonna be just pressing the direction towards the enemy. On top of fighting the enemies, while you explore, you will find different weapons and armor to use as well as finding canes, potions, and scrolls that'll be used for different spells and attacks. Whenever you pick up any of these items, it will only be identified by a particular color, 
and unfortunately this is a mystery to you until the first time that you equip or use them. Furthermore, every time you play, these color assignments are randomized, so it's not like you can just make a note and say like, oh, the blue cane is the blizzard spell. It'll be totally different the next time you play. And you're taking a chance every time you use something for the first time because there are curses that are possible. The items that you use can rust even if they're made of leather, so that means that eventually it will disappear so you have to keep some other items on hand, but you can only carry so many at a time. But it's not an overall inventory of how many you can carry, it's per item. So you can carry a certain number of weapons and a certain number of helmets, etc, etc. If you need to make room in your inventory, you can always just drop it on the ground or throw it as a weapon. Now earlier, you'll remember that I was talking about your hunger meter, and this game is one of the many that has the trope of if you find meat on the ground, it's totally okay to eat it. Is it cooked? Did any of the monsters poop all over it? Who knows? Who cares? You'll be fine. Well, for the most part anyway. You see, food is not an item that can be kept in your inventory. Your character will eat it as soon as he picks it up. He has no self-control. Eat too much and your character will become stuffed and start to become slow. This means that for every step you take, the enemies will be able to take multiple steps and the same goes for attacks. Continue to be a glutton and your character will straight up die if he eats too much. Since this is an RPG, there is an experience point system, but it's pretty simple compared to what you might be used to in other games. You never know at any given time how many experience points you have or how many you earn each time you kill an enemy. And that number that you see on the screen? That's not your experience level, that's what floor number you're on. The only way that you have any indication as to what level you are for experience is by some titles that you get, like beginner, master, or warrior. For those of you who are not fans of permadeath, the game does actually have checkpoints every five floors. So this means if you die, you'll go back to whatever was the last checkpoint. You might have to redo some of your progress, but it's better than having to start all over again. If you are a purist though, there's nothing that forces you to press start to continue. Oh, and one last thing about the gameplay. There will be gold that you will find, but it's not for what you think it is. You might think, yeah, sure, it's to be able to buy more stuff. Nope. You just find the weapons on the ground, as I mentioned before. There are no shops. The only point to having the gold in the game is for when you die. If you have very little gold, there's going to be nobody at your gravestone, and it'll be a pretty crappy one at that. The more money you get, the better your gravestone is, and the more people that will be at your funeral. It's kind of cynical to think that the only reason why you're grabbing the gold is that one day I'm going to die, and I want it to be nice. Even for early Genesis standards, the graphics in Fatal Labyrinth are a bit simplistic and not very detailed. There's not a whole lot going on, and there's only a change in what the environments look like every 10 floors. Yes, the layouts are randomly generated, but the actual tile sets look exactly the same. Again, the origins of the game were through a service that used a dial-up modem to be able to download it, so things were kept to a minimum, which includes animations. You essentially have a sprite of what you look like when you're walking, when you're fighting, and when you're standing still. And the same goes for the enemies. When you attack, you might miss or you might hit them, but you won't know from looking at it. It will only be from the text on screen and the sound effect that plays. And those sound effects continue with the minimalist nature of it all, where there's very few to hear and they're not all that special. The music is somewhat decent, but you're gonna hear the same loop over and over again, and it only changes when you once again get to those every 10 floors. Growing up, I was a huge Sega kid, and I love collecting games for my Genesis, but Fatal Labyrinth wasn't one of them. I never saw it in any stores, and I didn't know anybody who owned it. It wasn't until I was much older where I discovered playing this game through Sonic's Ultimate Genesis Collection on the Xbox 360. The majority of the games in the collection were ones that I had played a million times before as a kid, so seeing something I had never heard of before intrigued me. At first I thought that it was a game I never heard of because it wasn't very good, but I quickly learned to get over its limitations and found it quite addictive. I started finding myself saying one more run, one more run, and just trying to get a little bit further than I did the previous time. Fatal Labyrinth is highly flawed, but a lot of fun can be had if you're into simple types of gameplay and seeing kind of where genres had started from. If you do end up finding yourself having fun playing Fatal Labyrinth, there is a similar title that was developed at the same time for the Sega Master System and Game Gear 
called Dragon Crystal. It's pretty evident that they were worked on at the same time as it has a similar inventory screen and it reuses several of the sprites. If you are looking to play Fatal Labyrinth today, I should point out the fact that the original Genesis version doesn't have the option to save. You need to be able to complete it in one sitting, which is quite a tall task. You might be better off playing one of the later re-releases as that gives you the extra option of being able to use save state. I previously mentioned Sonic's Ultimate Genesis Collection, which was available on Xbox 360 and PS3, but there is also a more recent collection called Sega Genesis Classics. This newer collection had a wider variety of titles to pick from, had a cool little UI of looking around inside of a bedroom of the 90s, and has various borders and filter options to pick from. It was released for the PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and Nintendo Switch, and as per usual, the Xbox One version is backwards compatible on the Series S and X. On top of the home console versions, that collection was also released on Steam, but you also have the choice if you'd like to just individually buy Fatal Labyrinth for 99 cents.